Well, again, thanks for having me back for week number two. I wasn't told I was uninvited after last, last week's talk, so excited to be back for today. So we're really going to spend some time talking about the idea of, again, a simple thing we can do, something that we as emergency physicians and providers should know cold, but a big difference we can make on our patients, and that's saving a patient's eye by performing a lateral canthotomy. So like Sal said, I'm Andy Little. Um, I'm the host of the Emo Over Easy podcast. That's the last time you're going to hear about it. But I'm excited to be here to talk about something that's not related to our podcast, but to talk about some core content and some cool emergency medicine topics. So again, like we mentioned last week, this falls into that high acuity, low opportunity procedures. So the reason why it's high acuity is because the patient can lose their ability to see if we aren't able to do this. So this is something we should be able to do without having to look it up, without having to take a big pause, but no cold, the indications, the contraindications, the preparation, and the anatomy involved, because it only comes around every once in a while, and we don't want to delay saving somebody's vision. So let's talk a little bit about a case. So this was a case that I think is pretty similar to a lot of the cases we read about, about people who require lateral canthotomies. Um, I was working at our trauma center, and a patient came in. He was a plumber in a high-pressure kind of compartment where he was working on what he thought was a low-pressure system right next to a, a water heater, a, uh, a water softener, um, kind of in a closet. When, while he was working on this low pressure system, there was an explosion in the high pressure system to where he had some plumbing um, apparatuses basically blow up in his face. So he presented as a level one trauma with significant facial trauma, had, had a GCS that was a little lower than 14. I think it was 11 or 12, if I was to remember correctly, but came in with concern for he had burns on his face, he had bruisings on his face, he had external trauma to his face. And to be honest, this was a case where I really wasn't that worried about his eye because of everything else that was going on. So we did our ABCD assessment like you do with every trauma, and he subsequently had to be intubated because he had some, um, some broken teeth and had concern for a mandible fracture and, again, significant burns to the outside of his face. And I, I'll admit, we looked at his eyes, and they were both bruised, um, but initially the bruising was more concerning for a base or skull fracture. So he's intubated, you know, breathing's normal, circulation's normal. We look for we look for disability, and we did a secondary survey. And again, look at his eyes. Both of his eyes are really, really bruised, but it's consent. It's same side or it's bilateral bruising. It's no real difference. So he goes off to the scanner. About forty-five minutes later, he comes back from CAT scan. And I, I pop in whenever patients get back from CAT scan um, when I'm working on the trauma on a trauma shift, and I notice initially that, okay, his ET tube's fine. Do another kind of quick survey, make sure he's not bucking the vent, sedation's appropriate. And then I look at his eyes and the right one just looks, it looks different. And so I go get um, one of the nurses that was there for the initial evaluation. I even ask RT because they were there when we intubated the patient, go grab my resident. And I say, Hey, does that right eye look different than it did before? And everybody kind of agrees that the right eye looks a little different. Um, you know, we're, the, the CT images were up. And so uh, one of my residents was overlooking at that. And I said, hey, let's just grab an ultrasound. Let's make sure that we didn't miss a foreign body in the eye, that with this propulsion, there's not a piece of metal. And so we grab a quick ultrasound, do it externally. We don't see any signs of a globe rupture. Um, but again, this, this right eye is becoming more proptotic as we, as we discuss. And the CAT scan shows what's concerning for a retrobulbar hematoma. So we're kind of in this scenario where Immediately, my resident, who's a senior resident, is excited and says, hey, I think we probably need to do a lateral canthotomy. And so I said, time out. Let's do a quick review because they hadn't done one before. It's been a while since I had done one. So, so let's talk about the indications, contraindications, what we need, and then the steps we need to go through. So when we did this, we kind of talked about the indications for a lateral canthotomy. And it really kind of boils down to a couple of things. So no retrobulbar hematoma because um, this bleeding will just continue behind the eye. Um, decreased visual acuity. So the patient's awake and they're able to tell you that they have monocular vision loss that kind of is progressive on top of with these other symptoms of swelling and painful eye movements. And afferent pupillary defect, proptosis, which again, I mentioned with our patient was the first thing we noticed was this unilateral proptosis. And then of course, when you measure a pressure, if it's greater than 40 millimeters in the right context, it's concerning that you need to do a lateral canthotomy. So our patient had a couple of these. So we saw in his CAT scan, he had a retrobulbar hematoma. He was not, he was intubated, so he couldn't tell us if he couldn't see. He did have an afferent pupillary defect. He had proptosis and we checked the pressure and the pressure in the left eye was in the twenties. So not, not, not normal, but not really high, but the one on the right side, the affected side, it was 60. And I, you know, 
looked at my resident and said, Hey, we got to do this. And so we, we decided to do it. We, and then we kind of walked through what we needed to do this lateral canthotomy. And really it comes down to a couple of things that we're going to get to, but I want to bring up the complications first. So when you commit to do this, you have to know there are some complications involved. So the one is you don't do it all the way is that we get so excited that we don't perform a complete cantholysis. Um, we get a little careless with our scissors and we cause a globe rupture. Um, a surrounding structure injury, very, very rare. Uh, of course, there's gonna be bleeding because there is some vasculature there. And then of course, a delayed um, finding or complication as these can become infected. But really it's what do we need at the bedside? So having done a couple of these, I know now just to ask for a laceration kit because in a laceration kit, you have a sterile drape that brings a straight hemostat or a needle driver. There's a set of iris or suture scissors. There's a set of forceps. You ask for the lidocaine with epi and then you want some normal saline for irrigation afterwards, um, and even in procedure if the eye is very, very dry. So again, here's all the stuff you need. And again, this is found in a laceration kit. So rather than remembering this entire list, if you have to remember a couple things, ask for a laceration kit, and then ask for some lidocaine with epi. So this is what you need, it's in your laceration kit. And I really wanna kind of focus on this idea that, and the last thing you really need is just to be brave. And so this is one of those moments where, like I talked about last week at the Bougie Assisted Crike, you need 20 seconds of unopposed bravery and courage to do the right thing for your patient, to not be scared about what you're doing, but because when you do it, you will have a life-altering um, change for the patient. They won't go blind or their chance of going blind significantly decreases with this procedure. And so remember that like, you're going to be scared, but for 20 seconds, you got to be brave. When we, I'm going to show you here in a video, and it really takes 20 seconds of unopposed bravery to pull this off. And real quick, before we get to the video, let's talk a little about the eye anatomy. So when you read case reports of why people had some complications, um, one of them is they, they made cuts in the wrong places. And so we wanna remember that we wanna spend most of our, our entire time in the lateral part of the eye. We're gonna be messing with the lateral canthus that has a superior and inferior crus. You wanna stay away from the medial side because that also has a superior and inferior crus. That's also where the tear duct is. And so that can cause some, some problems. And you want to try to avoid the tarsal plates for what we're going to do. And then I'm a big fan of, even though I'm not going to wait for my ophthalmologist, I'm going to give them a heads up that I'm about to do this. I'm going to say, Hey, I've got a patient in our case. It was, I have a 20 something year old male, significant eye trauma. He's got an interactive pressure initially of 60 right prior to procedure. It's now 75. He's got a retrobulma hematoma. He's got proptosis. He has an afferent pupillary defect. I am performing a lateral canthotomy can you please come in and help me? And then you hang up the phone and then you go do your procedure, but make sure you make that phone call because they are the definitive treatment for this. And we are just stabilizing the patient until they can get definitive operative management. All right, so we've decided that our patient needs a lateral canthotomy. For this video, we're gonna assume that that squiggly line on the right is gonna be the patient's nose, while those squiggly half circles on the left is the patient's ear with our model that you can find in the show notes is in the middle representing the patient's eye. So we decide our patient needs lateral canthotomy and we're gonna anesthetize the area we're going to cut using 1% lidocaine with or without epi, either one's fine. You're gonna anesthetize the eye, wanna make sure you anesthetize multiple areas, every place you're gonna clamp, every place you're gonna cut, as this is a painful procedure. So we wait a little bit, make sure our patient's got some anesthesia, and then we decide, all right, we're gonna use a straight forcep from our laceration kit, and we're gonna bury it down, traveling on the outside of the eye, and we're gonna clamp down for five to 10 seconds. Now, as you're clamping down, you're gonna, again, verbalize to the room what you're doing, why you're doing what you're doing, and the indications for what you're doing this for. Once you let the clamp be there for five to 10 seconds, you're gonna take the clamp off. Make sure you have a good indentation, and then you're gonna use your straight scissors from your laceration kit. Again, everything you need is in your laceration kit. And you're gonna make a straight down cut through the lateral canthus, attempting to release the eye. Once that cut is done, you're going to reevaluate the patient, and that reevaluation can be done based on a pressure change in the eye or by a reevaluation of their symptoms. If these are unchanged, we're going to move on and cut the inferior cruce by making a 45 degree incision from our original incision. And then, if worst case scenario, it does not improve even again, hopefully by now, ophthalmology is at the bedside you can perform one of the superior crews as well. Remember, this is a procedure that as you do it, ophthalmology should be in route. 
as the patient will need definitive eye surgery after this procedure. But again, I hope this quick video and using this model makes you feel more comfortable when performing your lateral canthotomy. All right, so you've performed your lateral canthotomy. Ophthalmology is hopefully at the bedside. And if they're not, you need to call them again. These are patients that although we've stabilized the eye for now, they one need definitive treatment of the cause, so retrobulbar hematoma, can be a mix of ENT ophthalmology depending on where you, who covers that where you work. But you need to get your other specialists mobilized to help uh, facilitate them getting definitive treatment. So again, we talk about the case that we had. Again, we did our lateral canthotomy. We did just the lateral uh, we cut just the lateral canthus. Didn't have much of a pressure improvement. We went from like in the 70s to the high 60s, did an inferior cruise, pressure dropped to in the 40s to where it was manageable. By then, ophthalmology was at bedside. And they, in maxillofacial surgery, because of the patient's facial fractures, took the patient to the OR, where the patient actually, on day seven, was extubated and walked out of the hospital um, a couple weeks later with his vision intact after this traumatic injury. So again, I wanna focus on the fact that what we talked about, this is actually, when you think about it, a pretty basic thing to do from an anatomy standpoint, from a procedural standpoint, and from tools you have in your emergency department. But the one thing you need that's more than anything else is 20 seconds of unopposed bravery and courage. Because if you do this, you can make a huge difference in the life of your patients. So again, this is one of those high acuity, low opportunity procedures that if you don't feel comfortable with this, you should. So build a curriculum for yourself, whether you review one a month, one a week, until you feel comfortable with this large number of, pa uh, large number of procedures that fall into this category, but take the time to learn how to do this. You will change a patient's life. Again, if you have any qu questions or concerns, you can take a picture of this QR code to take you to references, a couple other videos that I think are worth watching and some awesome blog posts from a lot of places, including one from Ripple Ian. So again, and this is my last plug. If you wanna follow Ian over easy and hear more conversations, from me and my, and my cohort, please follow us on one of our social media platforms. And thanks so much for having me.